Coming up on Digital Music Trends 214, recorded on the 7th of January 2015, recorded music sales decline in 2014, the Pono Music Store launches, UMG's deal with Havas, PJ Harvey recording in a glass box, DJ Qbert's MIDI vinyl case and Apple's 14-day return policy on digital goods in Europe. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and welcome to the first show of 2015, it's the 7th of January and here at DMT we're ready to take on another year of music tech madness and if you're listening on a streaming service and have a caught a glimpse of the latest podcast related headlines, thanks to Serial obviously, why not go and download one of the podcast apps so that you can actually download the show on your device so check out the ios podcast app which is built into ios 8 or downcast for that and we start the show today with a great lineup starting with robert singerman joining me from new york robert works with dot music the brazilian music exchange Real lyric find and as we'll talk about today as well uh, the caribbean music summit so hi robert and thanks for joining me today how's it going great hi andrea it's great to have you. And uh, also with, the sh- uh, with me today on the show, it's a pleasure to welcome Jay Herskowitz, a music technologist and co-founder of Hatchet, Hatchet Industries. So hi, Jay, and thanks for joining us today. Hey, Andre, good to be back. It's great to have you back, and I hope you both had a great start to the new year, a great first week. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, the first thing that we talk about every year, it's been now it's now the sixth year that uh, I do DMT, so uh, I've got a bit of experience uh, doing the first week's episode, uh, and uh, it's all about recording music sales. So obviously, uh, Nielsen Soundscan and uh, the uh, BPI uh, in the UK are uh, busy uh, giving us figures on what's happening in in the recording music realm and uh, the first numbers around the US recording music sales uh, are uh, pretty bad when it comes to actual album sales for example you know they plummeted 11% compared to 2013 uh, from 289 million to 257 million and the digital track sales declined by uh, 12% uh, with the Pharrell's Happy topping the bestseller list with 6.45 million downloads so uh, it seems like uh, the, the one saving grace uh, for uh, US uh, uh, numbers is streaming uh, with a 54% increase in 2014, totaling 164 billion plays. So uh, a lot of numbers to, to grapple with here. Obviously, a decline in physical, uh, digital sales, uh, digital uh, albums and uh, track downloads, but a rise in streaming. Uh, uh, Jay, you know, obviously nothing new here. Uh, from your perspective, do you think there's a bit more confidence in the market at that uh, streaming might pick up the slack eventually of, of recording mix- music sales? Um, I think there is... Um, I don't know if there's confidence. I think there's acceptance um, right. that the transition to streaming is happening. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see it fill the void um, left by uh, uh, you know downloads declining right. in terms of pure monetary for recorded music. Um, but yeah, I think everybody has kind of now finally grappled with and said, okay, streaming is here. You know, the thing that you don't see in any of these reports this year is really any talk about piracy, and, and that right. conversation has largely disappeared over the last couple of years. So. Um, you know, uh, uh, that's obviously a positive movement for the industry, but, um, uh, y- you know, obviously streaming has always, in my mind, been an inevitability. And so yeah. we're just to the point now where everyone's trying to figure out how to make those businesses work um, yeah. with, with the model that exists. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's interesting to see that w- the only figure that we saw from BitTorrent uh, was the, the number of legal downloads through the BitTorrent bundle service rather than the number of illegal, illegal downloads. And uh, Robert, from, from your side, uh, uh, how do you feel about uh, the, the recording music industry? Obviously, you're involved in quite a few events. Uh, uh, w- what do you feel are the trends in terms of conversations that are going on when it comes to figuring out what's happening to the market? Well, in the U.S., uh, Deezer just came in, so maybe they can be a, a competitor to Spotify and increase the streaming this year. It should increase significantly this year, I think, uh, and subscriptions should increase as well. Uh, you know, I do think there's still a lot of, uh, you know, illegal BitTorrent downloads as well. I did read some chart the other day about the, the uh, tracks that have lost uh, uh, 10 million uh, or, or more. I Maybe it was even way higher than that, I can't remember, but the, the, the top you know, illegally downloaded track. So, yeah, I mean, the conversation is definitely shifting from piracy to streaming, and uh, vinyl certainly isn't you know, <laughs> increasing, but not picking up the slack of yeah, exactly. uh, the dig- digital download um, uh, decrease. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, in terms of trends, you know, I do think that 
obviously music is ubiquitous and, and, and there are more and more ways to generate income from music. Uh, uh, technology is changing rapidly and, you know, streaming might not be the, uh, you know, the, the, the end either. You know, there's, there's other things happening. Uh, Pono's come out uh, yeah. this year and there's, you know, there's a few other, you know, different ways of, uh, of uh, generating income in, in the music industry. Uh, as well. So obviously, uh, Rob, you mentioned the the the, the Pono, and uh, uh, that's been an interesting story actually that developed today from uh, uh, Las Vegas, uh, and uh, we've heard uh, that uh, the Pono is making a big splash at CES. Uh, it's uh, it's being uh, tested on the floor, and there's a lot of people that are talking about it in the mainstream tech press because the Pono is actually going to be available from next week uh, for anybody uh, to buy essentially. So uh, that's uh, an interesting development uh, because they delivered obviously the Kickstarter uh, uh, Ponos uh, to the backers in December and now finally the device is making it into the w wider world and we're gonna get to see really whether people are interested in uh, buying it that didn't back the Kickstarter initially or whether it's a project that was uh, so, you know, sort of somehow uh, uh, self-enclosed in, in that pocket of, of uh, 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 potential customers that bought it the first time around. Uh, uh, the other interesting thing about the Pono is that the store actually went live uh, so uh, the Pono's uh, music store uh, powered by Omniphone has uh, started to uh, sell music and uh, the, the pricing is kind of uh, as expected uh, you can you can get uh, CD, uh, albums of uh, varying quality from uh, 44.1 kilohertz at uh, 24 bit all the way to 192 kilohertz at 24 bit uh, there's only a very uh, small amount of albums available at the highest uh, range of quality for example Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water uh, whilst D'Angelo's Black Messiah is available at 96 kilohertz and 24 bit and the pricing for the higher uh, quality albums range between $17 and uh, $24.99 which is uh, it's uh, you know it's high but it's uh, it's understandable given the, the costs of actually transferring old albums back in uh, into a digital format at a high enough standard um, the pricing also seems to be uh, established by the label because uh, for example uh, Elton John's Goodbye Albrick Road costs uh, two uh, the tracks on that album cost two dollars forty nine a piece whilst uh, uh, when you look at D'Angelo's uh, at the same quality uh, his tracks cost one ninety nine a piece so definitely an element there of the labels deciding the pricing so uh, uh, Jason I I'm kind of uh, eating my own hat when it comes to Pono because uh, uh, you know I've been saying it for a few months now but it, that the project has really turned the corner and they've managed to deliver uh, a decent product with of course you know the, the same concerns we had around the design that we had uh, a year ago but in terms of the actual product it seems like it sounds really good people can hear the difference and they're excited about it uh, w w you know do you feel like it, it can expand beyond that original uh, bunch of backers no I, you know i'm not uh i'm not very bullish on pono in general yeah. um you know i think it's uh kind of an outdated model uh it's a niche of a niche of a declining market right um and while i think that it probably sounds very good um i've never heard it um, most people have never heard it. I have. Got a whole it is. It is good. It is good. <laughs> yeah. No. But this is this is a massive marketing problem, right? You've got a whole generation of people that don't know what good what good audio sounds like. Exactly. And yeah. so trying to explain to them that as you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're talking um, bit rate and 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 sampling rate, most you know, there is a tiny fraction of the population that even understand what that means. Yeah. Let alone what they can imagine what that sounds like. So. Um, trying to tell people that this sounds a lot better without them being able to experience it is going to be a massive problem. And then you've also just got the the issue with the overall model of uh, the pricing, the downloads, the syncing to the device, um, the need for the device to have really good headphones, which most people don't have, and yeah. or really good stereo, which most people don't have. So I just think it's a it's uh, I think that the cards are really stacked against it. I think it will find you know a small niche of users that are very much into audio quality and have. Uh, you know, home stereo set up with floor speakers or have really good, uh, you know, um, high-end headphones and are in the market for, you know, um, uh, you know, high-quality, um, mostly classic rock. Yeah, um, yeah, but, which is a, uh, you a lot know, of the catalog you see right now on, on, the, on the site as well. Uh, it's, it's kind of a giveaway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same thing when you go, you know, you look at uh, uh, Garth Brooks's, you know, ghost tunes. It's, you know, right. the catalog is what you expect it to be and yeah. and so i think that there's that's kind of the niche within the niche i think yeah. you, you got so although, um, although the I, garth brooks story I, I don't really get the garth brooks story it really annoys me <laughs> 
I, I would be I'll, be I'll be interested to hear what it sounds like because I haven't listened to high quality audio in a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, but ultimately, you know, it, the mass market, most people don't care. Uh, yeah. Convenience trumps quality always. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think well, it'll find a, it'll find a little small market, but it won't change the world. I think that part of the conversation of having better stereo, uh, better sound, better experience with music is an important uh, conversation to have, and I think it, I think it will be more and more in the mainstream with Pono starting, uh, and I think that. That's a, it's it's a valuable conversation in terms of the value of music, which I do believe is still has to be uh, um, worked not from the classic you know rock side also, but from the you know the independent side, the you know the Jack White type, you know vinyl um, yeah. uh, um, proselytizing and the uh, and, and commercializing. I, I think that uh, I think it is important actually for people. That they understand the difference between good sound and terrible sound uh, with MP3s, and I do think it will reflect, you know, ultimately in, in a in a deeper and richer and uh, more prosperous market, uh, especially when when people can, you know, hear the differences between um, well recorded, you know, very well recorded music, well mastered music, and music that's not so well recorded. Uh, yeah. Uh, auto tune for the mainstream, so I, I think it. I think it's you know it is a niche. I agree with you, a niche. Um, but I do think that it's a, it's a really important uh, new aspect that could actually start to change things back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, guys, actually, another question I wanted to ask you was uh, around. Uh a retailer. So Jason made a very good point uh, around the fact that the Pono needs to be heard in order for people to appreciate what it does. And uh, that, that was certainly my experience. I was very skeptical until I heard the device and it does sound remarkably good, especially on the on the higher bit rates. Uh, uh, and I was trying to figure out in the, in the US especially what kind of store we could foresee this device being used in. For example, I was thinking uh, you know, it would make sense to see this in an Apple store. The problem is that they have, of course, a competing uh, system of selling music and the design is a bit clunky, so I don't think Apple would be uh, uh, ready to have the Pono in, in store there. Uh, what other retailer has sort of the... could have interested customers there it's, and, and yes, could it's showcase like it? Blue, the Blue Sky market, like, uh, like Putumayo Records, for example. Um, you know they're selling pretty much everywhere so you know museum shops uh, you know tourist locations um, and you know I, I, I recently um, signed an agreement that I'm working with a, a digital distributor called Altafonte which is the biggest Spanish uh, digital distributor and they have a and physical uh, independent and they have a big JV with uh, played against Sam PS um, so they're worldwide, and I'm working with them in the states. That they would love to distribute Pono's, for example, because they still do distribute physical uh, product, and they still have relationships with stores. Um, so I, I, I do think that I, I think that the um, you know the music business and the kind of blue sky business, where there where there are opportunities to sell interesting new products, as well as you know appliance shops and the Best Buys and Targets and you know, Walmarts around the world. Uh, you know, if if they, if people do hear yeah. it, like we used to go into stereo shops to listen to stereos. I mean, there still are a few stereo shops around. Um, I think that uh, but the more mainstream, I think that it would be more and more successful. Because a bit more of an impulse buy, in a sense. And and, and Jay, uh, for, uh, from your front, I wanted to ask you. Uh, you know, three hundred and nineteen dollars. Uh, the Verge says it's a, a you know, crazy high price. Uh, at the same time, we've seen Sony come up with uh, a twelve hundred dollar uh, high resolution Walkman. So you know, comparatively, is actually not that much, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, comparatively to a set of ten thousand dollar four speakers, it's not that much either. But you know, what's the market for that? Um, you yeah. know, the market for a twelve hundred dollar Walkman is uh, five, right? Uh, you know, are there industry professionals, great pro audio, you know, great. But you know, if you're talking about mass market, I, I've got no problem with targeting for very small, you know, segments of the market. But um, you know, we can't. Nobody can rightfully think that a twelve hundred dollar Walkman is a mass market product. <laughs> yeah, I so, think a three ninety nine photo or three hundred dollar photo. Well, do you think that would hit more mass market? Okay. No, I, no. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, everyone's walking around with a phone that costs them two hundred dollars. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I think carrying around a, a secondary device, I think a handful of people will do it. Um, but you know, I just 
But I, I, I don't see it, any other portable playing device being mass market than your phone. I mean, yeah. there's also a market that's screaming for the return of the iPod, classic iPod. You know, that's also a very small part of the market that, that want to carry it around that way. Yeah. But, you know. And it's kind of it's a, it's a weird thing because like we're seeing the hardware part, uh, and obviously that's 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 a part of, that's a big part of the Pono Play right now. But uh, at the same time, you'd think, well, even if the Pono Player goes away and it, then the circuitry gets integrated into other devices, you know, the the store would still work. At the same time, they are licensing the tracks from record labels that are probably paying for the transfer costs. I don't think Pono are paying for the transfer costs themselves. And at which at which stage then the labels would be able to license it to other stores that want the same tracks, and so Pono wouldn't have a an advantage in that sense uh, other than having come to market first so yeah a lot of issues there i mean if they can drive you know if they can create awareness that you know you, you need better dax in your phone and you need better uh you know you, you just need uh, better audio processing hardware in your phone you know great but the fact that a pono you still have to go you know to your desktop buy download sync to your pono and then take it with you. I mean, that's what everybody is scrambling to get away from that model, right? Yeah. We just talked about that that model declining. So, um, I think from an awareness perspective, that you know what they're doing there, the couple other people that are pushing flax and, and high quality audio, cool. Uh, I, but most of the time, again, if the market's converting to streaming, which it is, you're not going to stream flax over your mobile network yeah. um, just because it's too much data, and or it's going to cost you five times as much to get an unlimited data plan so you can stream lossless um, when most of the time you're listening on you know the free earbuds you got with your phone and you're not going to hear the difference anyway yeah. so um, you know I like the conversation about higher quality audio but uh, and maybe that will help force the hand of some other people to invest a little bit more in it yeah. But I don't think people are going to move in mass to specialty you know, solutions. And it has to be said that there's a huge amount of focus on audio at CES. I mean, I've, I, have, I don't think I've ever seen as many uh, wireless headphones, uh, high resolution headphones. Uh, the Momentum line uh, has just launched their wireless pair, which is like a ridiculous amount of money. It's like 600 plus dollars. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, you know, a bunch of different uh, speaker manufacturers come up with Sonos competitors that are trying to get a slice of that market. So it's definitely a big year, I think, for consumer audio hardware which is bizarre beats. really who would have thought beats of course yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely beats is kind of uh, also in there and we're gonna see what happens with the apple integration uh, i'm sure everybody's expecting big things out of that so yeah an interesting space and we'll keep we'll keep an eye on what's happening at ces i should have a guest next week that was a ces and so uh, she's gonna be able to tell me a little bit more about what happened over there uh, uh, robert let, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the the caribbean music summit so uh, how are you involved with the, with the conference and, and uh, what is it all about uh, i'm sure a lot of my listeners will will love to know well, it's um, it's sponsored by the uh, Ministry of Tourism of Barbados. Uh, my partner, Mark Frazier, who um, also is the owner and founder of the Sync Summits, um, uh, has created this event uh, partly to uh, to bring awareness to the music of the Caribbean and introduce reintroduce the music of the Caribbean to the world and vice versa, the world of Caribbean, but. <laughs> also to have a great place to have a conference uh, in the uh, uh, space vacated by Mita moving to uh, to uh, June. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it's February 1st through 3rd this year, uh, which is roughly the same period as meetem has been. We have a lot of great speakers. Uh, it's gonna. It's the first year, and it was only contracts were signed in sometime in October or something. Oh, wow. So it's actually great. a pretty short runway uh, <laughs> yeah. to it. So my guess is about 500 people this year. It's not going to be medium size or south by size, but usually smaller conferences, in my opinion, can be better because you get to everybody gets to meet everybody. Uh, yeah. All the speakers and the delegates are more uh, uh, closely related. Barbados is a fantastic place. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's not a bad place uh, to do a conference, especially have, as uh, a the Brides of Funkenstein, one of my favorite, with Bernie Morel coming down uh, to right. perform. There's other showcase <laughs> nice. artists. We're we're working on some other new, very exciting keynote uh, speakers from uh, close islands and some other participation from some of the other islands. Uh, it's the 70th anniversary of Bob Marley's birth, uh, February 6th. So we're trying to uh, create something around that, uh, which might be announced in the next few days, hopefully. Uh, nice. So it's um, it's it's. Uh, 
a new conference and a different kind of place uh, that isn't really known for its music conferences. Uh, and you know, we have some good support from the uh, Barbadian government. I mean. Uh, everybody uh, knows Rihanna from Barbados, and Eddie Grant's had a studio there for many, many years, but yeah. they don't know much about the other music uh, uh, coming from Barbados, and you know that's one of the things the Barbados government wants to do. But there's a whole uh, major, um, I think it's called One Caribbean, there's a whole alliance between the Caribbean islands uh, to promote more the idea of not just going to one island, but really experiencing all of the Caribbean and going from island to island to island. I just participated in a conference, a tourism conference actually in Jamaica fairly recently where they discussed that in depth. And I think that, you know, we're, we're working towards that, uh, you know, now with the whole new Cuban thing, uh, with the government, with the U.S. government, uh, uh, you know, we're also working towards getting Cuban music into, into you know, and Cuban music professionals into this uh, event as well. Yeah. So it should be an interesting event. It'll be you know, it'll be a great it'll be a great first event. Uh, I hope as many of your listeners as possible can come down. Uh, yeah. You know there are some very major speakers and and people coming in. You know, uh, Martin Mills is registered. Uh, he's not speaking, but he's going to be there. Um, um, you know, uh, Joe Belliotti from Coca Cola, head of entertainment from Coke, Eric Schlenkop, yeah. music dealers. There's a lot of music supervisors who will be there. The Sync Summit. Faithful. Um, sure. So it's going to be a great event, and awesome. uh, I hope you can make it. No, it's very exciting, and I, I, I would uh, uh, I would recommend going checking out uh, CaribbeanMusicSummit.com. You can find all the lineup there. Uh, it's on the first, second, and third of Feb. So if you are able to just uh, get uh, you know a, a three, four week uh, uh, notice a ticket to Barbados, or if you are in the area in Florida or somewhere around there where you can uh, sort of fly quite easily down, uh, do go and Blood check it out. Also. Sorry? London has direct flights as well. It does. It certainly does. <laughs> Although, it, 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 at the end of January, it's uh, right about the peak time, I think, for Beta's holidays. <laughs> I would imagine it, it would be uh, relatively expensive, but you know. Uh, and uh, and I know, uh, go and check out the, the site, and it, it's quite fun. And also, uh, the Sing Summit is coming to London too, so I'm sure Mark will appreciate us mentioning that in uh, March, I believe. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's another, another one for your calendar to put down. Uh, Jason, from your end, anything that you wanted to plug uh, halfway through the show, or uh, that you've been working on that you'd like to talk about um you know always uh, talking about tomahawk there's a beta of our android app um if you guys want to check it out uh, you can get it from uh at least you can follow the links to get it uh from get yeah and so we've got a few thousand users on that beta and we're continuing to develop that um not all of the kind of uh features are fully flushed out yet but um uh we're happy with where it is and and we're getting some good feedback from that so so you can check that out and sync everything you've done on your desktop with Tomahawk to your mobile so yeah check that that's out. that's super exciting and, and I, I kind of I keep thinking whether I should just get an Android device just to test stuff out because people keep sending me press releases of Android uh, uh, apps they've released or, or or you know different designs for the Android app than for the iOS app and uh, but the only thing that is that it would only make sense for me to buy like a, a cheap tablet from Amazon uh, for example at which point yeah, yeah. you wonder whether that makes any sense because you, the experience you get might not be particularly good. So, I just uh, bought a uh, I just bought a one plus one. So, uh, yeah, three hundred bucks. Oh, okay, cool. That that works. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I'm happy with it. Nice, nice. I, I should give it a shot, really, because uh, I feel cut out of the whole Android scene uh, entirely, which is not very good for me. And uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, let's actually talk uh, for a second about uh, Erwin Steinberg, uh, uh, who uh, died, unfortunately, uh, this week. Uh, he was the former CEO of Polygram Records, uh, and he co-founded Mercury Records uh, in uh, Chicago back in uh, 90, 1945, a very long time ago, and uh, uh, that was immediately after serving in the Air Corps. And and then in the, uh, 1961, Philips acquired Mercury, and in uh, 1962, uh, Polygram was born. And uh, Steinberg spent uh, over 30 years uh, there, and uh, uh, you know, through uh, his stay at Polygram, he also oversaw the acquisition of a bunch of different other labels. Uh, and eventually, in 1995, Polygram was merged into Seagram. Uh, it was merged by Seagram into Universal Music Group, uh, and essentially became the backbone, in a sense, of uh, one of the, the world's largest record companies. Uh, so uh, definitely. Uh, a, a very important figure for uh, 
the, the recorded music industry uh, that uh, passed away this week. Uh, I wanted to move on to talk a little bit about uh, Universal Music Group, actually, and continue about uh, talking about Universal Music Group because they made an interesting deal with uh, the Havas Group uh, this week, uh, which uh, uh, should hopefully help uh, the label uh, mine uh, more uh, data, uh, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully boost uh, uh, recorded music sales in the process. So uh, this is called the Global Music Data Alliance. It was reported on by the Financial Times, and it aims to combine uh, Havas expertise in online consumer behavior with Universal Music's uh, a huge playbook of recording artists to make them more market, uh, to make them more uh, effective in the market. And uh, uh, you know, so analysts have uh, commented positively to, towards this development. Uh, you know, record labels have been doing a lot of market research over the last few years. Uh, they're trying to figure out segmentation of audiences, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps they're still uh, falling a little bit behind when it comes to uh, doing a comprehensive uh, data mining, which could be seen as a good or a bad thing, depending on who you're talking to, really. Uh, and <laughs> Jason, uh, do you think that uh, this uh, we're going to see more of these deals uh, made between uh, you know uh, uh, companies like Havas and Universal Music Group to try and make the most out of the millions of fans that are following uh, the likes of Rihanna, for example, or, or Justin Bieber? Yeah, I mean, I think you see a lot of labels now they're paying for services from guys like Next Big Sound or Music Metric or other folks that are kind of earlier in that space uh, of trying to really um, get a more holistic picture of kind of who these fans are and what else they're doing yeah um so the havas uh umg thing is interesting i don't uh, i i'm dying to learn more about what form that actually takes yeah there was there was a lot of kind of just high level speak and arm waviness going on but i i'd love to know what what that actually means yeah um so but yeah i think you will see more of that of people trying to understand how to better segment and follow behaviors across web browsing to listening to purchase behavior to everything else and and try to just get a really broad view of who these fans are and, and what they like, and that will help Havas better target um, campaigns to those fans uh, as well as vice versa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Robert, is there anything uh, you know as far as uh, trying to reach out to the, to the right fans? You know, have you seen any any interesting developments? And is there any any are there any panels, uh, for example, at the Caribbean Music Summit that, that are addressing this this issue of uh, of trying to figure out uh, really who, who to uh, go after? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, data mining and who to go after with the fans is one of the most important things uh, that's coming up and one of the uh, advantages that we have with uh, with the uh, computer age that we're in um, so uh, yeah there 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 is I can't remember the title of the panel but there are there are panels dealing with with relationships with fans and I've seen a bunch of new uh, startup companies I'm involved with one of them called Acusic which is going to launch soon that ho that helps uh, direct the you know uh, the discovery process, the monetization process, and can relate to different uh, uh, big companies like Havas or whoever. Uh, uh, you know the, the whole Getty deal with uh, the content uh, being free with credit uh, for for certain usages. I think you know they're kind of uh, at one of the intersection points too of of content and distribution. Um, so I think there's yeah there's a whole lot of movement in that direction. Um, yeah, you know, it's one of the things on the dot music situation. If if the organization I'm working with, uh, Constantine Russo's group, want, wins uh, the community uh, music community for dot music, that will also help pave the way for all the um, you know, legal business of dot music to be uh, legal business of the music business on the internet to be under dot music. Uh, right now, the other uh, competitor that we have for the community has lost the community uh, badly. They got three points out of 14 or further. Uh, so right now, the, 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 it's either us or the highest bidder between Google, Amazon, four other venture capital companies, oh, nice. us, and, uh, uh, far further. So, I mean, that, awesome. that also can change the game with respect to the fans, music, data points. Um, Absolutely. Uh, That's exciting. Actually. I haven't seen Constantine in ages, so I hope I'll bump into him at some point soon. Yeah, it'd be and, good to have him on the show soon because uh, right now is, is a very interesting time since Far Further yeah. Lost and we're really the only hope for the music community to uh, actually 
have any say whatsoever what happens with .music, which probably 100 million people will have at some point in the relatively near future. Nice, very exciting. And uh, uh, going from uh, talking about data uh, versus data and an aggregation of data to to our, an artist that said uh, to hell with it, uh, PJ Harvey announced that she's uh, uh, going to record her new album inside a glass box uh, structure in front of an audience. So uh, no, you know, direct to fan uh, experiment, no marketing experiment, just uh, a plain old uh, live performance, but the performance of an entire album that will be recorded uh, uh, behind uh, a, a glass essentially to uh, prevent uh, the musicians from being disturbed by the experiment. Uh, uh, this uh, will happen in London and uh, uh, all the dates sold out almost immediately. Uh, they were, they're priced at about £15 each and uh, uh, they uh, uh, will allow uh, listeners to uh, go in for about 45 minutes I believe and listen to the recording of the album. So uh, once again an artist that's trying to innovate uh, on, on what actually she's, she's actually doing rather than innovating on purely the marketing aspects uh, of, of, of a campaign. Uh, uh, Jay, do you think we'll see more of that and, and uh, you know, should artists uh, try and be more creative on, on, on the actual, uh, you know, creation of music rather than try and find new ways to actually sell the music? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll see, and you already are seeing lots more focus in kind of the experiential uh, realm of, of how do you um, create premium experiences for your biggest fans to be able to come and spend money on and things that previously haven't been monetized. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you will see more of that. You see, you know, obviously you see more and more kind of VIP tickets being sold to concerts, backstage meet and greets, stuff that, uh, you know, diehard fans would pay money for. Um, and there's really no cost associated with it um, yeah. in terms of incremental cost to the, to the artist to be able to do that. So, you know, I, I, I think it's great. I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, you guys, I'm sure, have probably seen albums being recorded. It's, can, it can be pretty dull. Uh, so, <laughs> exactly. So That's going to be the interesting know, uh, part, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know kind of how the reaction will be to that, but, you know, it's certainly an experience that they can tell their friends about that they saw PJ Harvey, you know, recording you know, tracks for her album. Yeah, because I, I thought that they were rehearsing the album for a certain amount of time during the day and then they recorded it with the full band. But I, as far as I, I understood later, are they actually tracking the album in a sort of fairly traditional fashion, uh, which could make for an interesting experience if you're just there listening to a bass drum being recorded or. <laughs> <laughs> or a bass line uh, which is exciting right. for bass players but it might not be as exciting for the general public of PJ Harvey fans that could have expected perhaps to see her but uh, yeah it's going to be very interesting how the response to that is but I'm sure you know it was only 15 pounds I don't think people are going to expect uh, that much out of it it's, it's a very affordable experience and definitely something that people are going to come away with uh, knowing that they've experienced something that they might be able to uh, listen to again on the record and uh, um, you know, talking about actual release campaigns, uh, there was an, an interesting one this week uh, uh, by DJ Kubert, uh, who released a vinyl artwork uh, for his double LP released on a uh, Kickstarter, uh, which integrates a MIDI uh, uh, controller, essentially, that's controlled by Bluetooth technology that allows uh, uh, those who bought it to control a, a, a bunch of DJ's app, uh, DJ apps, uh, uh, starting with uh, the specifically an app called DJ uh, on, uh, the f on your phone or iPad. It uses a MIDI printed, uh, you know, circuit uh, pr printed circuits uh, to control uh, to the, the MIDI uh, side of things and it's a pretty original idea it, it looks pretty awesome I, I've, I've seen the video uh, of the uh, cover in action and so uh, I really hope there's going to be a bit more of that uh, come up in, in, in the future uh, Robert uh, you know you do a lot with the independent sector do you think that uh, developments like printed uh, circuitry and uh, other on-demand type experiences that you can uh, now afford uh, whilst you know maybe like five years ago this would have been a completely impossible for an independent artist to achieve will uh, enable independence to uh, create a, a greater variety of products when it, that accompany the release of music yeah certain people can create different uh, creative uh, packaging and uh, devices and you know more and more that can happen but I think you really need, uh, you know, if we're talking about mainstream again, I think you really need somebody like Tom York to do the kind of <laughs> experiments that he can do, or PJ Harvey that can do that, because obviously when an independent artist does it, how many people are they going to be reaching? Uh, you yeah. know, uh, the, the, creative, the creativity becomes a marketing campaign in and of itself, like PJ Harvey. Um, and, you know, if, if there is something that's amazing, you know, uh, OK Go, for example, you know, in terms of videos, uh, yeah. you know, it became their whole you know, campaign, and then you know, there's lots of groups who, who, who have something so amazing that, that it becomes uh, viral, right? I mean, look at all the YouTube bands, for example, or the YouTube characters. Uh, 
um, who were not known and are not having you know big advertising campaigns, but all of a sudden, because it's something that people want to see, it's shared a lot and and uh, and uh, can do it. So so absolutely, I do think with uh, technology and also let's face it, we started with recorded sales decline and income yeah. from music recorded music declining uh, people in a way almost have to get more creative as well to yeah. uh, to, to make it through um, absolutely you know, I, I've seen some other eras where uh, you know a certain kind of music was all that was ever played and you know through creativity and through hard work and through uh, you know keeping at it people actually broke through to the next level uh, all the time so so the people who are willing to put that extra effort in and have something to say and have you know, have have a talent of it. You know, they are going to continue to be able to make it, even if the general industry is declining. Yeah, and Jay, uh, talking about the uh, New York community uh, in terms of developers, one of the things that I found in London, I think uh, the organizers of Music Hack they found in general, it was it was that it's it's pretty difficult to get musicians involved in. Uh, uh, hack days and other experiences of that kind because uh, they feel kind of uh, outsiders and it's kind of it's, ha it's hard to bring them in essentially um, that was true back in 2009 but you know over the years I think the situation has improved and uh, with projects like this of, of, of DJ Qbert do you think that independent musicians may be more willing to start a conversation with developers and and technologists to figure out interesting ways to present their work and and uh, you know do you think we're gonna see a, a, a larger trend of hap that happening from an independent perspective rather than it being like a Warner or Universal that has lots of money to spend that goes to the developer and commissions a certain uh, thing to happen yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I think it's a great, I think it's a great trend, and you know, I, like you said, the early music hack days, there were no artists there. Uh, the more recent ones, you start to see some, uh, you know, some of the more brave ones that aren't too intimidated by the, the, you know, the tech coming in, and and you know, I think it's a great collaborative process. It's the creation of a of an additional uh, vector of art, right? And so they'll be able to sit down and and brainstorm and collaborate with folks and do something interesting. I mean, um, uh, the the vinyl mini controller. Uh, I think is is very cool, and it's kind of interesting to see people exploring um, kind of uh, 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 the paths that package goods companies take, right? Like, how do you differentiate in packaging? Uh, and so, you know, you're seeing people try lots of stuff, which I love, and I love the experimentation. I hope more artists get involved. I hope more artists reach out to those in the tech community. There are some of these kind of, you know, more well-known guys in the music tech hacker community that do a lot of work with artists right. uh, around campaigns and, and um, you know, they do them over and over. There are a handful of guys that are doing campaigns for lots of artists and they're doing really cool interactive videos and sites and apps and, and um, I think that's helping from the marketing perspective yeah. uh, and I think it's also helping both the, the technologists and the artists kind of, um, uh, you know, converse at a level that has them thinking about the other people's pro you know, the, uh, the problems that each are trying to solve. Yeah. So, you know, I hope more of it happens. Uh, I hope the hack days evolve, continue to evolve, and get more artists uh, engaged. And I hope it just becomes much more collaborative. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And, and New York is an is a interesting community, actually. I, I was speaking to somebody uh, a few weeks ago that was telling me that, you know, you still have... Uh, music tech meetups happening very frequently in New York there's a very active community perhaps even more so than in London to a certain extent uh, today so uh, definitely an, an exciting place to be uh, right now to work in music tech and uh, I hope I'm gonna make it to one of these uh, in the next few months and uh, and see uh, yeah, what uh, most interesting I mean I go to conferences all over the world all the time and see a lot of hack days even in places like Lisbon from um, meetups uh, from Mafra, I remember I worked with some of those guys in the last one, um, but uh, last year at South by the, the the South by Music Hack thing that was done by Travis Lauderdean was yeah. huge. I mean, it was packed and it was really exciting, and there was a lot of music and also main companies were there as well, uh, uh, Warner Brothers and you know Grace Note and all, all the other uh, you know a lot of the big companies were there too. It was and it was it was the biggest uh, anything's ever had. Uh, also, some of the festivals are doing uh, hack days as well. Uh, you know, uh, festivals around the country. So I, I think that musicians obviously are aware that you know the technologists are the rock stars these days, and I think that uh, you know they, they they realize that they have to if they can't do it themselves, they have to find friends who have uh, special skills uh, and and yeah. collaborate with them if they want to do something different in the business side of of. Uh, of their world now. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, uh, there's uh, there's uh, 
the idea that obviously the development costs a lot of money. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, and uh, you know, depending on the scope of the project that you're working on, uh, you know, you could do something cool for you know as little as a thousand or two thousand uh, dollars. You know, if you're working with the right people. Uh, so definitely uh, something to bear in mind. And finally, I wanted to finish with a European story, but I'll, I'll ask you your angle on it. And uh, iTunes has ha implemented a European policy now that uh, enables the customers to request a refund uh, for up to four, uh, for, uh, 14 days after the purchase of music, uh, movies or apps. So this is a very interesting development because it means that uh, theoretically, as far as uh, we understand it, uh, you could buy an album, download it and then ask for a refund uh, because uh, there is no DRM on the music itself. And so it would be very difficult for Apple, Apple to police whether the Apple uh, album has been deleted from the user's hard drive or not. Uh, things are a little more different with uh, uh, movies uh, because you could uh, purchase a movie uh, and then if you if you uh, if Apple you know takes it back essentially they could break the DRM that's attached to the file and so that would uh, effectively uh, mean that you don't have it anymore but you could have watched it and uh, on the app front that's also a little bit concerning for developers because developers are thinking what if somebody buys a game that is like 10 bucks uh, plays plays it all the way through uh, and then requests a refund at the end of the two weeks and, and wants, wants the money back uh, so a lot of uh, a lot to think about there uh, I suspect Apple is going to implement this with a, with a piece a pinch of salt so that if people were doing this all the time they may actually pick up on it and they may block the account I, I don't know I'm just speculating here uh, uh, Jay from, from your point of view you know as a developer and somebody that is close to the music community do you think that there's some some room for concern here for developers that have, have a lot of sales in Europe uh, you know I think it's um, I, I think it just shows how much the conversation um, has changed over the last few years I think uh, I don't think many people are going to game this system just because it's no. not worth the effort. No, exactly. um, you know, unlike five years ago, ten years ago, the people that want to listen to stuff for free have got way easier ways to do it than buying it and then trying to return it. Um, yeah. Go to YouTube and listen to it, or you know, spend ten bucks a month on on one of the subscription services. So, um, you know, I, I saw a piece in there like, what if you're an artist and you you wanted to spike the charts and so you buy a million downloads and then return them all? I mean, that's obvious flags and, and uh, you know someone's going to notice that's going to be noticed so yeah. uh, you know I, I think it's fine I think you know there'll be a handful of people that, that try to game it and it's you know maybe they'll get away with it but in the grand scheme of things I don't think it really is, it makes that much of an no, impact. No it's not going to be a huge uh, it's not going to make a huge difference I mean especially from an app perspective I actually already returned a few apps over the years maybe like three or four apps in the last four years uh, one a year I would say uh, an app that was perhaps a bit more expensive that I spent maybe 10 bucks on and then I realized that it doesn't work or that it had a, a big flaw with it or something wrong and then I essentially I went to iTunes and I said look this app doesn't work as advertised it costs 12 bucks I'd like my money back please and they, and they do it without asking any questions so it, it's it's not I don't think it's a new policy in terms of apps but it's definitely very new in terms of the other type of media uh, books are included too in that in that equation as well uh, and I think that's uh, uh, about it for this week uh, uh, I'm sure I missed out loads of stories. Of course, we've been offline for about uh, three weeks uh, since Christmas, so there was a lot to talk about. Uh, uh, but thanks so much for bearing with us, and, and uh, uh, thanks so much, Robert, for your time. Uh, once again, uh, go and check out the Caribbean Music Summit uh, and find out more about that. Also, the Brazilian Music Exchange and the Dot Music. And thanks so much for your time, Robert. Thank you. And uh, thanks so much for your time, Jason, as well. Uh, and uh, for Jason, you can find him on, on at J. J uh, go and check out Tomahawk. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if you follow him, I'm sure he'll, you'll uh, learn a lot of interesting stuff. He shares some very cool things uh, uh, pretty much every day. So uh, thanks so much, Jason, for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me again. And uh, thanks for listening to the show today. Uh, the DMT comes out every week. Uh, next week, uh, I will be in Groningen for, for Eurosonic. So uh, I'm hoping that the show is going to be recorded uh, there uh, in some uh, format. Uh, it will be recorded there in some format, even if it's just myself uh, talking uh, in, in a room. But uh, it will be live uh, probably uh, Friday rather than Thursday, uh, just because of the uh, time required to, po uh, to process uh, the video afterwards. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And uh, till next time.